Hey everybody, uh, it's really good to be back online with you again. And this this um, this interview is well overdue, I think, because Jake and I have been social media friends for a while, and we both have kind of similar themes. And I've always been a fan of people that can kind of express their mission in really short, brief words. You've got the words "stop doing nothing," and today we're lucky enough that we have uh, Jake Thompson with us who runs a, a brand in the company called Compete Every Day. So uh, Jake interviewed me like a month ago and I was very happy to reciprocate. So Jake, I don't even know, I can't even remember where you're located. So can you even start us off like telling us like where you're located or where you're locked down in the country these days? Yeah, where I'm locked down. I'm up in a suburb of Dallas. So I'm just a few hours south of you. Ah, that's right. So Oklahoma City, a quick shot down I-35 over the Arbuckle Mountains. Up in, so you're north of Denton or south of Denton? Just south of Denton. So I'm, I'm almost the farthest north Dallas-Fort Worth uh, that would be considered with Denton kind of its lone island up there by itself. So yeah, I'm right outside in Frisco. Got it. Okay, Frisco, that's right. Just a second ago when you said Frisco, before we were chatting, I was like, is he on the West Coast? No, that no. That didn't sound right <laughs> at all because you're pretty close to me physically. Yeah, and I don't think I, I grew up loving San Diego and wanting to move there, and then I realized what taxes look like there, and I said, <laughs> you know, I'm good with Texas, no state income tax. I'm I'm happy to stay here, and I'll just travel. Got it. So so born and raised is that is that where you are? You kind of a born and raised Midwestern guy, or are you kind of yeah. from the coast? Born and raised, uh, grew up about two hours east, east of Dallas, outside of a town called Tyler. Uh, my hometown, Jacksonville, was like 13,000. So you think Piney Woods of East Texas, Friday Night Lights, football is <laughs> a religion. That, that is Texas through and through. Grew up there, went to school uh, at, at TCU, Texas Christian University here in Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, and then never left the Metroplex. Thought I would, ended up staying for grad school and work and how that all kind of developed. And now I'm, this is home and I don't think I'll ever leave. Got it. You, you sound like me. The, the, the coast is where I grew up and it sounds really appealing. And I love to visit San Diego for, you know, just like I love to visit Vegas for about five or yep. six days and I've had my fill. It's like, yep. thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to the West where I can afford a gallon of milk and a gallon of gas. Thank you very much. That's so, right. So you spent all of your time there, and so after grad school, did you did you like immediately go into work, or what kind of led you, I guess, to where you are these days? Did you have like a job right out of college, or did you like jump right into business? What what, what kind of happened after that grad school? Yeah, I probably have one of the weirdest resumes you can imagine. So I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be a sports agent. I wanted to be the next Jerry Maguire. That was kind of my goal. And so when I was finishing at TCU, the NFL changed their certification policies that you had to have a master's or a law degree. So I immediately had to jump into grad school to right. get an MBA. Uh, at the same time, I started interning for an agency, uh, really an agent uh, out of Austin, was doing mostly research grunt work at the time for him, didn't really pay the bills. It's an unpaid internship. Uh, so part-time, I also worked for the Cowboys. Uh, had my foot in the sports, uh, sports space. I managed one of their weekly radio shows from a promotional standpoint. And then when the season ended, I started working with the arena team, um, the Dallas Desperados back in the day. And so fortunately, that experience built some incredible connections and friendships I still have. But worked with them for a season, finished up grad school, still working at the agency, decided about two weeks left in grad school that I didn't want to be a sports agent anymore was not the job I wanted or had expected. Got out of that fall of 2008, which we all remember what the economy was like then. Yep. And I was just trying to get a job. And so I had, you have a kid who non-traditional work experience, uh, MBA, probably a little too cocky about what he could do mm -hmm. uh, and couldn't even get a job at Best Buy like for the holidays, which you would think like that's the time to go. Yeah. Like people that want to deal with Black Friday and crazy holiday shopping, Nope, couldn't get it. So what I started doing is freelancing. Uh, I started reaching out to everyone in my network, said, hey, I can do basic graphic design. I can design collateral. I can help you with social media that's still really new, um, get you set up on accounts, and really just started building a network that way in clients. Uh, one kind of led to another, led to another. And, and once I would get in the door with the project and start talking to them about business strategy, brand strategy, marketing, it started to open doors for other contracts. It'd be like, oh, 
man, that we actually need some of that. So how can we add it in or how can right. we have you start managing this? And so I did that for a handful of years uh, and really made some good money with it, but wasn't fulfilled. Um, I hated the fact that my time was my only asset I could sell. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't selling my time on a contract, I wasn't making any money. And so that kind of didn't appeal to me, as well as the fact that I just lacked a lot of purpose in my work. I, I was making good money. I had toys, but I wasn't fulfilled with what I was doing. Because honestly, looking back, it was just about me. All I cared about was getting more money, getting a contract, getting more toys, and then kind of enjoying life on the weekends. Right. And so I started exploring this idea of pursuing greatness in life. What would it look like if someone competed against their own self every single day, pretty much in everything they did? What would their life look like at the end of it? Like how much more fulfilled would they be? How much more could they achieve? How much more depth would be there with relationships? And so I started playing with this message. And I was trying to fit it into my consulting business. And then I tried to work it into a few different uh, kind of entrepreneurial ventures that never really gained ground. And then my best friend at the time uh, was my roommate said, hey, why don't you look at this company? Life is good. They're out of Boston. They do about 150 million a year wow. basic t-shirt. It just is a stick figure guy, ironically named Jake. Uh, <laughs> and the message says life is good. He's like, it's in every airport. He was like, why don't you try it? I had nothing to lose at that point. I was like, okay. Uh, we had planned to go on a guy's trip to New Zealand. Uh, the trip fell apart when my biggest consulting client was a startup that ran out of money. The next day, my roommate was laid off. Uh, he ended up spending his trip budget for an engagement ring for his wife. Mm -hmm. I decided to put mine into a few boxes of t-shirts and tank tops with this just CED compete every day message on them. And started selling them out of the trunk of my car behind a CrossFit gym in Dallas or at a coffee shop or in anywhere I could get people to listen for a minute. So that's kind of how that whole journey started. Uh, you know, the consulting projects, I've had a few over the years. I've had a few that were close to the nine to five setup. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, it's, it's been uh, eat what you kill and, and trying to find as much as you can. Uh -huh. So the, you said something that I want to kind of talk about a, a yeah. little bit. The serving time, you know, you're, you're basically you're saying your time is your only thing that you can sell. So it almost sounds like, you know, we, we may not bill hourly, but we, you know, we kind of live and we kind of live and die by what we can get done in an eight hour period, which to me is just not the best, you know, I guess kind of the best way to survive. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out the exact way to phrase this, but when, when you now, nowadays, are, are you totally kind of separated from that or are you still in that world a little bit or, yeah. or now that you've been in business for a few years, are you totally away from that? How does that work now? No. Yeah. So the way the company is structured now is very much multiple income streams, multiple okay. channels intentionally for that reason. Um, you know, when we, even when we started shifting to apparel, I mean, I can go to sleep, wake up the next morning and we have orders from West Coast. We have orders international. Money's still coming in without me being always tied to it. Okay. Um, but I still in regard my speaking is time. Like that is a big revenue source for our company, especially now is before COVID, me being on the road, doing trainings, doing keynotes, workshops with organizations or associations. And right. so you're still buying that time. That time at this point, like I love because right. I, I enjoy the interactions. I enjoy being on stage. I enjoy selling that mm -hmm. because I've also gotten to a point to say, Hey, my time is my money as well. Right. I want to do X number of gigs a year or certain amount of income. And that's my target. Um, and I learned that very quickly from a, another keynote speaker who's, she's been an amazing mentor to me, but she's like, I want to do now 20 gigs a year. Mm -hmm. Here's my fee. I want to average. Uh, and I just want to do 20 and I want to work eight to nine months a year and spend three months with my kids and not worrying about being on the road. And, and so when I he heard that, that's how I wanted to structure that. So I still sell time, but I have the book, I have the apparel, you know, we're working on some other projects now that make the time piece, not the main piece. And so it's almost like, Hey, this is a big piece of our company. We, we love it. We want to add it, but we're not solely dependent on that. So that way, if it ever disappears, like right now, or we have to adjust it or it scales back, right. we still have these other pieces we can move with. 
Got it. So multiple streams of income. How many streams do you have now? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah. So right now I've got some investments I've made in uh, kind of on the side that bring in a little bit of recurring. I have keynote speaking and workshops. I've okay. got the apparel business uh, and the book. Okay. So, so really four, about four. Four um, of income. Yeah. Okay. I do sporadically some one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, small group coaching with people. Um, we don't do a consistent plan because okay. I, it, it's something I enjoy, but not something I want to promote. So I only work with about four to five people a year and it's not cheap because it's a time investment on both. Right. Um, so I have that as well. Um, but that I consider is the icing on the cake because it's not something we actively market and promote, but if it's a referred in, we add that in. So that, but that's been a, a stage process. I've been in business 10 years and it, right. it took five to six before we started layering in any other ones. So if you were to, if you were to talk to someone today, what, what, at what number of income levels do you feel like comfortable to where with one, if, if like one disappeared, you'd be okay with and this may be more of kind of a revenue question versus lines of income. You know, yeah. For example, I like, for me, I would like to have like no less than five. That's my goal. Is there a number that you're comfortable with? Is like three your minimum these days or four? What are you thinking? I mean, I feel like the more I'm in business, the more I don't think there can be enough. Uh, <laughs> mainly because you, you, I look at, I looked at a few years ago cutting them out. I looked right. at getting rid of the apparel, changing our model, and then we didn't. We stuck with it because we saw, well, this revenue source drives this revenue source and leads, and this one pulls leads for over here, and so they can all be interconnected. I think for me, four to five is a good one to have because. As of right now, in March, one was completely shut off, mm -hmm. uh, which created initially a panic, but then we had the other three to four to rely on. That one is slowly start opening back up, but okay. as we know, anything can change overnight. So if, if USPS goes under or whatever the case may be, and we have issues on the apparel side, mm -hmm. we still have these other revenue sources we can rely on. And so I think it's crucial, not necessarily from day one to have multiple income streams, right. but to plan to add them in because I think you have to get really good at one area before you can start layering in the other ones. But it's important in your head to say, okay, what else do I do well that we offer that our clients could benefit from that would be in a similar silo? It doesn't impact. So it's like with us, we sell a lot of apparel. Cool. There's only so many t-shirts you're going to buy, but you probably are going to buy a book or an audio book. Right. And, oh, you know, I may hire you to come speak because I love the gear. I love the message to our company. And so those pieces all play off of each other in a very synergistic way that I think works really well. And I think that's why you see, especially in the online space, like nutrition pro or fitness programs also offer nutrition because it pairs really well together. They right. offer additional coaching. Those kind of things are kind of how we have to look at building the business block by block. I think in our space, um, I mean, thanks for, thanks for that. I was, I was, sorry, I was losing my train of thought there in our space in thought leadership. What I, I've often heard people say that we kind of, we don't, we aren't really selling shirts and books and, you know, keynotes. We're selling more of an experience. So you built the books and the t-shirts and the speaking. Is, is that how you're seeing your compete everyday brand some of these days if someone's just not buying one thing the the larger clients for example are they buying like like a whole experience they're being like a package of things from you it's it's honestly varied by the client uh you know what we try to do is add to that experience for them a lot of times when they're reaching out for speaking it's like we love this message we want to infuse it in our team mm -hmm. and so on our end it's like okay how can we can additionally do that well that's setting up a you know video ahead of time to tease the talk to get right. them excited to start to build I do that it. too yeah it's uh taking these little compete everyday wristbands we have and maybe doing them in company cultures or if there's a specific phrase mixing that in and giving it to everyone so that way when they leave not only have they gotten some motivation some actionable tips in the talk but a week later they can look at the wristband and they're reminded of different things uh in the virtual setting because it's changed so much an hour and a half workshop is pretty tough to do in terms mm -hmm. of maintaining everyone's attention. Right. So one of the things I've started doing is how can we extend the experience that's not quite the same as if I was hanging out with you and we were talking and, and I can work the room and the stage, 
but I can do a 30 to 45 minute video. Let's do a live keynote. And then I'm going to send you over the next four to five weeks, a two to 10 minute video clip that's going to add on what we just shared. So that way we're extending the life of that experience. Um, some companies are like, Hey, we want to buy a book for everyone in the room. We want to buy a t-shirt for everyone in the room. Like nice. we want it all in. And so we see that too. Uh, but really it's kind of on our end, as you said, in that, this thought leader space is we're selling this message. And because the space has changed in terms of an in-person experience, how can we build the experience in a virtual remote setting that maybe extends the life even longer? Got it. So it's not, so it's not just you're on stage and you're off stage and they forget about Jake. It's you kind of want to bring them into your world and you want to keep them in there for a while. So they don't lose the impact of what you said when you were on stage, correct? Exactly. I mean, it's the same reason you and I probably host podcasts. Like one, selfishly, we love conversations and learning, right? But two, how can we continue to invest in people? knowing that over the long term, they're probably going to do business with us because we've provided value and helped them. Most people that we launch a podcast and you're running, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 episodes and you keep it going, you're not making direct money from it. You right. may make a little sponsorship, but it's the long-term experience piece of like, oh my gosh, like I'm there, I'm with you. Like I'm a part of it. Like I, I'm all in on this community or this message and idea. And it just keeps you top of mind which is our biggest challenge as business owners is staying top of mind, especially in the thought leadership space, because it's a timing game. When's your next event? When's your workshop? What's your team need? Oh, I'm listening to this guy every week on a podcast. I'm watching you mm -hmm. know, Patrick's videos every day. This guy knows what we need from a marketing standpoint. Let's bring him in. Yeah. I've also noticed that one from, from the media I've done, whether it's television media or the podcast or my videos, it's actually helps a lot with pre-selling at least in my world, because I've got people who will hire me for consulting or hire me from speaking, and they've already watched tons of my videos, even ones that I've forgotten about. They're like, Patrick, you did this video back in 2013. It was awesome. I've been watching all your stuff since then. And it's like, they're more interested in kind of basically writing a check than they are the selling process. Do you find that if people have kind of consumed your content ahead of time, it makes the closing and the sales oh. process easier. Does that happen in your world? Without a doubt. It, it okay. pretty much makes it an easy, a very easy close. Now there's still obviously some negotiation, but they've already come to you. They know your stuff. They love mm -hmm. your stuff. Um, I've even seen that in the last month with the book. Like we booked two different keynotes for the fall. We hope in person could be virtual, but it's based on somebody bought my book. Mm -hmm. read it and said, this is what our team needs. And, and so as soon as they outreach to you, they already know, like, we love the message, the content, we're good. It's a very different when I'm outbound marketing, which an outbound sales, like we still do for speaking, right. of trying to share more of my message and, and getting them more comfortable with what we're doing. It's just a lot, not that it can't be done because we've had success, but it's a longer process and conversation and negotiation because they're not already bought into the message like that inbound. And so that's why I think the content piece is so incredibly important from either a podcast or weekly videos or book, blog, whatever is you build that relationship with people. So the buying decision when the timing is right is so much easier and quicker. Got it. Got it. Okay. I want to pivot a little bit and yeah. talk about um, people that, you follow that you learn from. Um, I'm a big fan and I push out a lot of content talking about kind of standing on the shoulders of other people. And, you know, for example, like I'm a big Jay Abraham fan. Yep. You know, we're both Tony Robbins fans and there's some other obscure names out there that, you know, I could pull up, you know, Bedros Killian from Man Up. I'm yep. getting at his work also. When, whether it's, whether it's when you started up or these days, who do you, who does Jake listen to on podcasts or who does Jake, what videos does Jake watch to get his inspiration? Yeah. So one of the guys early on in my career that I consumed a ton from was John Acuff. Um, okay. and, I, and I really loved his first book years ago was Quitter, but the one I kind of got introduced to him on was called Start, okay. uh, which is right in your wheelhouse, punch fear in the face and, and pursue. And he, he recently, his last one was called finish and it was around why people don't ever finish. Nice. I'm there with, okay. Um, so yeah, J O N A C U F F. And, and John's an interesting guy because he's one of those 
10 years in the making overnight success stories. Like he <laughs> wrote and wrote and worked for Home Depot as copywriting and did right. all of these things. So he was a big influence for me. I mean, at different, honestly, at different points in my career, there's been different influences. Um, and that, that's strategic because of how the business has pivoted and grown. Right. Uh, Grant Baldwin uh, has been very instrumental on the speaking side. Uh, okay. I, I went through even Grant's program seven years after I met him. So I knew, I knew Grant, that's how I got introduced to him was we met at a conference. Um, and so he was a big one. Um, Ann Hanley, uh, marketing oh, okay. coach. Ann's email on Sunday morning is like one of the favorite things I look forward to in my inbox because she writes the most friendly email and it's all about how we can write better emails. And she's very personable. Um, and so she's someone that I, I learned from, from a writing standpoint, how can I write an email more like Ann? Right. Um, Joe Rogan, I listen to at yeah. least once a week because you go back and listen to his early episodes and then you listen to one now and you're like, it's not the same person. <laughs> but Joe is a, a great example of someone getting in, learning the process, working it. How do I improve? And, and I enjoy now how he has conversations and asks questions what and how was, he'll follow. Right. What was his, really quick, I haven't listened to his early stuff. So what's kind of some of the things that changed in his early podcast versus the ones that I've watched some of the recent ones. Yeah. I've never he watched just, his startup stuff. So you should watch some of his startup stuff. He, he talked about it in... Um, actually in just one of his recent ones for him because he thought he could just come in and go and go right. and blow. And, and now he's like, I have to learn to like tease things and create space. And I have to allow the guest to go and then I have to follow them. I can't let them change subjects if there's something I'm interested in. He said, there's an right. art to it that I failed to understand. And so it was just a rougher, rougher interview. Okay. Um, which I think all of our first interviews are so much rougher in the beginning. But he said he had to go and get coached and learn and figure out how to ask better questions and how to let the guests tell that story and how to set the guest up on that. But at the same time, like he, he mentioned the other day, he's like, I will tell guests like what's off limits. Like if you have something you do not want us to talk about, mm -hmm. like tell me my job is not to embarrass you on the show. Right. Like I want to make sure we don't go here. And he said, then if they tell us, awesome, we respect that. Let's have conversations. We'll keep it away. But he said, if they don't, like, let's have an honest, authentic conversation about it. And so I, right. I really appreciate that uh, from him because one of the things I've tried to do is when I have people on our show, at least, I'll try to find old podcast episodes. And usually I've tried to find some that are two to three years old because mm -hmm. if they've done a lot of podcasts in the same year, it's a lot of the same questions and content. I mean, I know right. that going on as a guest for the book side. But if I go back two to three years, you may say something that I'm like, oh, I wish they talked about this more. And so on my end, it allows me to throw sometimes a curveball in a good way at a guest. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a big piece uh, of learning for me. I used to be big on Tim Ferriss. Um, I don't listen to his show as much anymore, but he definitely early influenced it, especially his style of starting with softball questions mm -hmm. that get guests to relax immediately versus here's my script, especially right. the type of people he interviews. Um, and then finally, John Gordon's a big one for me. Not necessarily as much. Him. Okay. Yeah, John Gordon writes fables. Um, that's okay. the best way to put it. He has 22 books out now. He does wow. about one to two a year. But they're all really short. You can read okay. them in 20 to 30 minutes. And they're fables. And they're all around leadership and character development and uh, teamwork and culture. And I, I've read John's works. I've read a number of his books. But where I learn and follow his story is from his business model and how he's built his business and his training. And so I consume him when he's a guest because I want to hear more of his story and how he did it. Mm -hmm. because I'm fascinated by what he's built now. So that's someone that's had a big influence on me as well. Got it. Yeah, I'm at his website right now. And yeah, right down the right side, there's like all these books he's written. You're right here. And they're all they're very short, simple. quick, easy reads. He's even done, it looks like he's even done some kids books too. He's done kids books around it. He does trainings. Um, he's got a list of speakers underneath him that speak now. Right. But he was like a, I think he was a restaurant guy and didn't do too well with it and wrote um, his first book, The Energy Bus, which is kind of the one that set his whole career right? and pitched it and nobody would take it at first, but it's essentially his story of being 
burnout and his wife getting ready to leave him and being in a bad mood and, and learning about the importance of your controllables essentially. And so um, he's got a really cool story that didn't start till his mid thirties. Right. And that's when he started left what he was doing and launched into this career. So. Got it. Got it. Um, I, I, interesting. You brought up the Joe Rogan one because that's what I'm just now getting into and, you know, you, again, you and I were talking before the, the recording was going about how sometimes we're more interested in the tech than the content. Yeah. Joe Rogan, as well as people, I'm actually interested in both because I love how as, a, as organized and as much planning as he does and what you said, if you always like, I like look at his set. And he's like, it's a very relaxed set. Very. It looks like they just do some microphones, like a conference room real quick. And they're like, we should do a podcast today. When I know it's not, it's very well relaxed. But like, you like look at the tables. There's like messy papers and stuff all over his his area. It's not formal and pretty. Like, like you know, like I'm not gonna say mine's pretty, but Joe Rogan is definitely more of like it feels like you're a guy having you know a beer with, uh, or in some cases, I, I was guess, about to say, but, <laughs> in some cases, <laughs> enjoy it. This is you know a lot stronger than a beer right there. So that's kind of one of the things I picked up from his is. Just how relaxed he's never, um, you know, you and I are kind of always wearing like a branded shirt, but it looks like he just like walks in sometimes unshaven with t-shirts and sweats on. He just sits down and starts talking, but I know he goes into a lot more planning. So that's one of the things I've taken away from Joe Rogan's podcast there. Yeah. And he does a really good job of if he, if he disagrees with you, like he wants to discuss it, he's not mm-hmm. going to just automatically accept it. Or he's not going to just fight you on it. He's going to be like, I don't like, tell me why you, you believe that. Right. And for instance, John Stewart, um, the daily show was on not recently. And John made a comment about, uh, obese people are healthy too. And Joe was like, no, like we have to dispel that rumor. Like Mm -hmm. we need people to get healthier and to get in shape. Like there, that's important. And it was very, but he, he asked John, he's like, why do you think that? And, and and so it was a really interesting conversation of, And he's done it from a political standpoint as well of like having people on he doesn't agree with, but he wants to have the conversation because he wants to learn. Am I wrong? Or what can I learn from how they see the world? Like, how do I better understand them? And that's the one thing I've appreciated about him, not just from a podcast, but just in general in life. Like business is the perfect example. There are a million ways to skin a cat. I mean, you look at the apparel industry, there's a million different ways people started. Some were screen printers. Some were influencers. Some people like me were like, we don't have either one. We're just going to throw it on t-shirts and see what we figure out. Like a million ways to build and develop it. Right. But it's all about how do you work that process and learn from all those other pieces and apply what works. Got it. Got it. Going back to your startup days a little bit. Um, I'm always looking for lessons. I, um, when I started my business, it was in October of 98 90 yeah October of 98 and I didn't know like as much as like what an invoice was yeah. I had no idea what I could I had to I was in a an Iowa hotel and my client wouldn't pay me so I sent them an invoice and I didn't have a laptop so I had to like go down to like the hotel computer and fabricate an invoice when you think about some of those early days and some of those things you didn't you did and didn't know how to do can you think of anything in particular that maybe you kind of wish you had known a little bit more about when you kind of dipped your toe into business? Oh my gosh. Uh, finances, personal financing being a big one. When I was consulting, I was making good money and I was living cheap with a roommate. Like I wasn't worried about like cutting it then, but then I jumped into a product space business. And so that was a tough one for me learning that took years. Um, I actually, the book profit first by Mike McCallowitz, Mm -hmm. I've given to almost every single person I talk to that's starting a business or in their first year, because I tell them all, if I'd read this book, when I started my business, it would have changed my life because I would not have dealt with the business debt I took on. I would not have dealt with obviously the pressures of that, but I would have completely changed how I approach business um, and how money comes into the account. The other thing that I learned pretty quickly on is Spend your money in in the apparel space, at least spend your money on the photography and the branding, not necessarily the custom products. Okay. Uh, And I say that because there's a million resources to screen print t-shirts to buy, you know, wholesale apparel, things like that. Right. And if you go on Instagram, there could be 10 companies that are using the exact same shirt 
to print on. They're using like different Canva, printers. Yeah. yeah, you can't you can't distinguish them, but their photography and how they spend on the design sets them apart night and day. You can have two identical T-shirts and how they're filmed or photographed and what they're game changer. Um, so that's a very big one. And, and then the last, I think that took a little bit learning the hard way is is quit trying to look bigger than you are all the mm -hmm. time. Like quit spending money you don't necessarily have to look bigger. Uh, just so you feel like customers see you in a different status light. And that was a big one for us because I was trying to compete with big brands in, in you know, CrossFit early days for us right. and trying to be like, how can we spend more and do more? And, and really we, our advantage was our brand message and how, what I should have been saying is, okay, how can we just spend more money getting the brand message out instead right. of looking bigger? Um, and so I think that's one we have to keep in mind because we get caught up in the Joneses, especially early on of comparing ourselves to other businesses in our space or, and instead of saying, well, what's our advantage and how mm -hmm. do we double down on it? We try to say, how can we look as big as they are, as, as strong as they are right. versus focusing on what our actual strengths are. So those man, personal finance and, and important investment in the branding and marketing side. Uh, and then don't try to overspend to, to look bigger the big three, I think. Got it. Okay, so a little bit off of that last one, yeah. when, when you are taking your brand, compete every day, and you're having to go out and pitch this to other people, what, how, as a smaller brand that we both are, how do you, how do you can, or what are some of the ways you've learned, without giving away your secrets, of how do you even come close to competing when they're comparing you to like, you know, another brand, which may be 10 times your size, how do you yeah. distinguish yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, that was a big one going into say we're at an expo and you've got Reebok, you've got you know, Nike or Lulu, whatever, and people kind of come in and look. And what I would always try to lead with was what we were about. Like we tried to put what we believed, what we stood for either on the shirt we, we sent everyone with collateral that reinforced it. We tried to really hit home the message that this is about the story and how can I talk to you about this story? And I can't compare our products to going and buying a Lulu item. Right. I like Lulu. I wear Lulu. We sell completely different products, completely different products. However, there's some overlap in some of the messages we sell. Right. And I believe 100% that a lot of times we buy apparel and shirts with slogans because we want to reinforce either to ourselves or to people around us what we believe. And what I try to do was find and create the products that reinforce the messages we want and then get them in front of as many people that have that growth mindset, that have that high achiever attitude and give it to them. Even if it's a smaller group, mm -hmm. how do we get it in front of them? And say, hey, that's awesome, man. I love those shorts from Nike. Those are amazing. Right. Cool. You should check out one of our shirts. Like, what do you think about this message? Like, what do you compete for? Tell me a little bit about you. And so we went heavy on the customer service and the customer selling and, okay. and storytelling side. Um, handwritten thank you cards for the first few years nice. of our business. Uh, we had to move to where it was kind of a printed letter thank you from me. Um, but now this year, we kind of, after the last three and a half years, we had all of our inventory with warehouse partners that would ship it disaster uh, in terms of accuracy rates. And so we took it all back earlier this year. As I was telling you off air, we moved into a new office, uh -huh. just hired a new team member that handles all orders and fulfillments. And the one thing we do is we put a thank you to every person in the card. And we don't do the full, Patrick, thanks for your order anymore. Right. But we have a printed card that just says, hey, we don't take your purchase lightly. We know how hard it is to earn money. We appreciate you investing it with us. And more importantly, investing it just to reinforce the message with you that you're going to compete. It's got my signature on it. And then we just put, thanks, Patrick. And we sign uh -huh. it, everyone, in like a blue pen. If I'm in the office and it's a slow day, I may look, hey, here we've got these outstanding. I'm going to sign them today. Otherwise, Courtney's signing every order. Wow. And the one thing we, the reason we did that is the last three and a half years, we had a ton of issues with orders that we tried to deal with from fulfillment mm -hmm. partners that just couldn't meet the standard. When we took everything back in, I issued an apology video to, to customers saying, I take responsibility. I let it happen. We're going to make it right. Um, we're going to go above and beyond this year. And so what we mm -hmm. started doing is adding a sticker and a wristband to every order. So there's another $3 we throw in right. and the handwritten card. 
and we see it on social media. We see people posting it and sharing yeah, it. Yeah, that's cool. And that's, it's not, I mean, for me, it doesn't cost us very much, a little bit of time, a right. little bit extra money in a, in a wristband and a sticker, but people are going to talk about it. They're going to post it. And ho all I care about is, are you going to wear it out? And somebody ask you what that is and right. where you got it and send it back. And so I figured on my end, spending the extra money to write a thank you card, to add a little extra goodies to an order as a surprise beat spending that money on Facebook or Google. I'll spend money all day on social media, getting them in the door. But once mm -hmm. they get there, how can we make sure they come back? And we found that that's one of the best ways is just tell our story over and over again. And the one thing we do, if I could find it, I actually don't have one here because I'm recording at home, okay. is our thank you cards on the backside have graphics. So we okay. intentionally take some of our t-shirt designs or sticker designs and we put them on the back of these four by six cards. Mm -hmm. I'll put the thank you card on one side, but the other side's a graphic because I know you're going to probably pin it up. Right. Or you're going to put it in a folder. Or you're going to keep it somewhere that you see it. And so it's that cheap piece of branding that reinforces what the message is. Like I will not let, and it's a blank spot, stop me from reaching my goals. And right. people will scribble in myself, my fear, uh, my past, you know, whatever that is. And then they'll take pictures of it, share it, but they keep it. It's just a thank you card, but the graphic helps reinforce that message. That's our only competitive advantage. That's interesting. The last part about putting the graphics on and having people save it for branding, because I have a shelf over here. You can't see it in the camera that I save all those things. Like you're talking about, like there's a company called Segmetrics I use for marketing reporting. And they sent me some stickers recently and I save all the stickers over here. And then a CRM company named pipe drive did that for me also. And they actually have like coffee for closers kept from the, from the, from the movie. Yep. They actually have that on my shelf over here. And then recently, and I'm going to totally give you credit for this. I had forgotten how important it is to like brand my laptop. And so I went out and I got a stop doing nothing sticker for the back of my Mac, but the company skin it. They, they give you the, the skin for your laptop in this cool piece of cardboard and it has exactly what you said. There's like a message on the cardboard. So when you open it up out of the envelope, um, it's over there. I'm not gonna reach over and get it, but it's even the, what you're talking about is the material that you wrap your own stuff in itself can be you know branding or messaging material. You can have messaging wrapped around your messaging is what it sounds like. Yeah, you, you can. And I mean, skin, it's great. I, I laugh. My laptop died a few weeks ago. I had to get a new one. And oh, as no. soon as I left Best Buy, uh -huh. the very next purchase was skin it to get a new laptop cover to print, to peel it on there. Yeah. But the, what I thought about with ours was we used to just do the thank you card. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, I've gotten thank you cards from companies and it's really cool to get, but you read it and you chunk it. You make a note like that's awesome. Right. But then you toss it. But I was like, how can we extend its life? And so I was like, well, people love our little manifesto design. Mm -hmm. So what if we put that on the back? They're going to pin it up. And then, you know, how do we utilize this? How do we, how do we take a, um, now it's a ways to get connected. And so it talks about the book, the podcast, the speaking right. on a card. And the backside is one of our newest designs. And so it reinforces, hey, if you got that design, we know you like it. But if you didn't, it's advertising that design and you're probably going to pin it up and keep it as a reminder, I'm not going to give up. Right. And so those little things like that for us huh. are just trying to think outside the box of like, what do we enjoy getting? And then mm -hmm. how can we make it live longer? And those hey. don't really cost us hardly anything. I mean, it's pennies to make those cards, right? But they extend the life from a marketing standpoint so much farther. Yeah. I mean, you're right on the packaging side. I know like postcards or whatever it is, it's, it's, you know, whether it's one sided or two sided, the price difference really isn't that much on some of that stuff. So that's it's a not. really, a really good use of that. Um, as we kind of come to a close here, I was wondering, I know you said you had some other projects in the works. Is there anything coming up that you could tell people about that are watching or that are listening that you don't want? I know you don't want to reveal any secrets, but <laughs> I would like to know, because I'm a little bit of a compete everyday stalker. I would like to know what kind of things I can look forward to in the near future. Yeah. So I have been behind the scenes working on a project called the daily competitor. Um, okay. And really what that is, is I was inspired by a speaker. Do you know David Burkis by chance? I do not know. Okay. I need to connect you. Oklahoma okay. guy. He's in Tulsa speaker as well. He okay, challenged me. 
Yeah, D- David does uh, his his latest book. Pick a fight is all around company cultures that have like a rally cry, okay. a battle cry. And David's a great guy. We were having a conversation. He was challenging me on our podcast, and he was talking about like why I don't do more solo episodes. He said, if your top 10 episodes on your show, two are interviews, three are interviews and seven are solo. Why aren't you doing more? I said, well, you know, there's different reasons I had. He said, you should do a Ryan holiday daily stoic style. And I started thinking about that. I said, man, that's a lot of work. And then I was like, well, that's how Ryan built a really cool audience. And so I have been kind of behind the scenes working on content and what we're Mm going to be rolling out soon is it'll be a daily podcast. It'll be Monday through Friday. Saturdays, I'm saving for like current topics. So if something's happening in the world, I want to give commentary. That's a Saturday. But otherwise, Monday through Friday, it's a two to six minute episode just designed to, hey, I'm throwing it in. I'm going to the gym. I'm going to work. Quick hit. Start my day strong. Mm -hmm. If you're not a podcast person, you have the option to get an email. And we'll send you the quick Monday through Friday email and the Saturday recap. But it's all designed to help you have a focus to start the day. And for me, selfishly, it helps me create content, source stories, work on sharing and how I'm telling them. But it additionally gives me a way to give you something smart to start your day and keeps me in your ear from a brand standpoint Mm -hmm. all throughout the year. And once I create 400 of these, well, then they're evergreen. Because right. they're not dependent on a specific topic, then I can mix in stuff. And so we're shooting videos. So we'll do two videos a week of it. The rest will be audio and written. Okay. But that's kind of coming in the pipeline, which is a monster project, but one <laughs> I'm excited about because by the time you get to day 400, you'll have forgotten what day one is and you can start the whole show over yep. again and just constantly keep it in your ear mixed in. And so Ryan's done a really good job with that. He did Daily Stoic. Now I think he does the Daily Dad, which is a fascinating one. But with our brand being Compete Every Day, we figured what a better fit to help me from a content sourcing and standpoint and really helping our audience, more importantly, start each day with that new focus, new something to think about to go that path. Nice. There's a... um... I follow a guy that does that. His name is Steli Efty. He uh, is from a company that makes a CRM called Close.io. And okay. every single day I get a YouTube video from him of something he just recorded. It looks like just that morning because I look at the dates on like YouTube and it's like, it's the current day. Wow. And this is like a five minute sales tip with a motivational quote in it. And then it gives you like tips about closing a sale that day or things like that. And uh, that daily thing, I've often thought, man, that would be a good idea, but that is a huge commitment. So, you know, lots of applause to you for even taking that on, especially 400 episodes, man, that's going to be huge. It's a monster challenge. My goal is to get a hundred video shot, which gives us a full year of two a week, roughly. Right. Um, I've got a ton of the content. It's just breaking it down, using Rev to transcribe it for me, Mm -hmm. cleaning it up, putting it into an email system. Uh, and then marketing it. And and my thought is we have a lot of email subscribers that just want apparel. We have a lot that just want the main podcast, but we have a lot of folks based on interactions that are just looking for something each day to start their day. And so we want to be able to provide that additional value and hopefully it turns into something. If not, it's one of those wonderful business experiments. Hey, this didn't work, but look at all this great content we got out of it. Right. Um, Lastly, um, is your book compete every day? Is that on Amazon? So it is, uh, okay. yes and no. Here's why I say that. Uh, so we went the hybrid route with publishing, which means okay. I have a publisher as well as we self publish parts of it Right. because of our traditional bookstore agreement. It's being pitched Barnes and Nobles targets, all of those places. Right. It has a release date of September 1st on Amazon for the paperback. Okay. That's because that's when the bookstore release schedule is. Oh, okay. however, so it, it stuck there. So, but you can go on Amazon. Now you can buy the Kindle version. It's ready to go. It downloads the audible version released this month. It's ready to go. Nice. And the paperback, if you are got to have it in hand, you can buy it off our website, compete every day.com. And we're shipping them. We've been shipping them since uh, May 1st. And so that's kind of how we're able to do it. Hybrid, the publisher mm-hmm. controls bookstores, Amazon, all that, we control our website and then at events, back of room type deals. So that works well as a speaker. Yeah. I was looking for Amazon because I want to send people to buy your book, but I also want to send to a place where they can like read the reviews of it and stuff. And so that's, there's both. 
So our huh? website has a ton of reviews. Okay, uh, people good. have written, because uh, we have a system with our apparel where we send out reviews on purchases and we've been very specific with the book. And so we've got a ton of reviews on ours. Um, I actually need to find out uh, on Amazon now that the audiobook's been out a few weeks, the, the reviews on there as well, because okay. uh, we don't get those reports. But yeah, you can read, you can hear what people think. It's a quick read, um, but it's intentionally designed to have actionable takeaways in every chapter. So whatever concept or choice I'm talking about, you know how to apply it in your career, your relationships, or your health. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I want to get people to go write the book and then get shirts. Um, I would highly encourage anyone watching or listening to go pick up a shirt also. Um, I am somewhat selfish when it comes to shirts. And I don't know if this is true for you, Jake, but I think there's someone bought a Compete Everyday shirt with whatever message is on it. I, I like walking around with this because every time I look in the mirror, which is multiple times a day, it just reminds me to basically focus. Whatever the, the message is, you're wearing an Ambition shirt today, right? If I yep. saw that correctly. Yep. Yeah, I've got to stop doing nothing up here. Every single yep. time I go to wash my hands or something in the bathroom, it's just a reminder. And so rather than just wear a red shirt, I would always rather someone wear a compete everyday shirt or just something like that as, as a small, subtle reminder. Same thing with the wristband. Um, you know, the wristbands is something on my to-do list to get for stop doing nothing. So people can go to the website and get a book. Can, or do you have any package deals? Can someone get like a book, a wristband, and a shirt all at once? So that's a great idea. Uh, I'll have it this time next week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get that thing ready to roll. No, it's, it's funny you say that. And for anyone listening and watching, we all have that item in our closet that is our go-to. If mm -hmm. we have an interview, a date, a big presentation, like we go to that suit or that dress, those shoes, that watch, like we have some outfit because in our head, it makes us stronger. It makes us more confident. It makes us ready to go. That outfit makes us a certain way. In reality, it's just cotton and clothing. Right. But what it does is the outfit reminds us of what we're capable of. And that's the one thing I've always been passionate about our apparel and the things we print on it is because it's really, it's not going to change anything, but it's there to remind you of what you can do mm -hmm. and what you are capable of. And so that's why I'm 100% with you on that. A plank t-shirt, yeah, it may be comfortable, but man, give me a message that reminds me, especially on those days we need it, that we're distracted, we're beat down, of what we're still capable of and get up and get going. Got it, exactly. That's where I, every single time that, you know, I start getting short on my own, stop doing nothing shirts, sure, it's time to print more. Because yep. I would, if I had my way, I'd find a way to wear one seven days a week. Yep. Just as a personal, a little personal reminder. So, hey, um, Jake, and I really do appreciate your time. I, I know you're a busy guy with multiple streams of income. And the th I think the thing I really took away from this is how much, you, um, how much you really focus on the quality of what you do from the business, not from the messaging standpoint so much, but from the business side, how, you know, the shipping stuff was really important. So you brought that back in-house. And, you know, the signature cards and the things you do like that. From, so from business lessons, I think people can really take away from that. And then, of course, the, the messaging uh, of Compete Every Day that, that you do. Uh, I think I picked up my stuff. I can tell you're doing a really good job because that's how I know about you. Your stuff is worn by my CrossFit coach, Trey. You know, Trey yeah. and his wife, I think, wear, wear that stuff. And I'm like, okay, after I'm done catching my breath after a CrossFit class, what is this stuff that Trey's wearing that says compete every day has? And so that's how I discovered you. And so uh, I think that's how I'm pretty sure that's how I discovered you. So man, I really do appreciate your message and you being in the world. And um, like he said, the web, the main website is compete every day.com. Correct. Yep. That's it. Yeah, and that's where you're going to go to get wristbands and t-shirts and books. And if you're somebody who has a massive, massive speaking budget, you want to get this guy on your stage <laughs> also. So uh, make sure you check him out. And as always, everyone, thank you for you know listening to us if you're on the podcast and watching us up on your YouTube. And also, please remember that Jake himself has a podcast and a YouTube channel, and you want to go follow him there and all over social media because I do, and that's the best idea. So again, Jake, sit in on our interview, buddy. Huh? Sit in if you're going to the Compete Everyday podcast. Sit down on our conversation with you, which is just a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. And you weren't even a different office back then at that point in time, right? Uh, no, I'm actually still in the home. I just had a different backdrop and everything. Uh, I'm, mo I'm moving in like two weeks. So I've had to start packing everything little by little. 
I think you and I both are basically shifting things. My banner is gone because yep. some guy's working on it, and yours is gone because you're you're packing yep. packing away. So, well, good luck on the move, and hopefully, I'll make it down I thirty five here pretty soon. As long as I stay healthy, maybe we can do a, a, an episode in person or something. Let's do it, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for being on. <laughs>